Hello and welcome. I'm Kimberly Underwood, Senior Editor at AFSIA International Signal Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to our executive interview series. Today I'm sitting down, uh, virtually of course, with Don McLean, Chief Cybersecurity Technologist at DLT Solutions. Uh, for DLT, Don designs and executes corporate cybersecurity strategies for clients. Um, he is a Forrester ZTX strategist and has a Master's of Science degree in Information Security from Brandeis University. And today we're going to speak with him about Zero Trust Architecture. Thank you, Kim, and thanks for having me. Sure. And Don, I know Zero Trust Architecture has been a big topic over the last year. Um, and it is a move away from perimeter-based security. Um, and there are confluence of technologies or cap capabilities at the heart of implementing ZTA, such as continuous monitoring, ICAM, identity credentialing and access management, orchestration, endpoint security, micro-segmentation, amongst others. Yeah. Um, I know some of these you consider are forward-leaning technologies and others are foundational technologies. Can you talk about what's important to consider there? Thanks. Well, we, at DLT, we like to divide technologies in, in cybersecurity into two broad categories. And our, our little slogan is that security is foundations plus innovation. In other words, the innovative technologies, the forward-leaning technologies, get a lot of press because they're new, they're different, they're exciting, or at least they're exciting to you know cyber nerds like me. And the foundational technologies are a little bit more well-known, more commonplace, but what we find is that very often, particularly in our government clients, or customers rather, the foundational technologies are still the focus of, well, the spending, which of course is what we're interested, but also what they really need to do. So any major undertaking and implementing a zero trust architecture is by any definition a major undertaking requires a solid foundation, just as if you build a house, if the house is, might look very, very nice once it's built, but if the foundation isn't solid, it's going to crumble. So foundational technologies are commonplace cybersecurity technologies that aren't necessarily associated with zero trust in most people's minds, but are still essential to the whole uh, zero trust picture. Technologies such as endpoint security, encryption of data in place, you know, be it data, database encryption, file encryption, disk level encryption. Um, <clears throat> and of course, as you mentioned, the identity credentialing and access management, or I, I sometimes called ICAM or, or shortened to IAM. The whole notion of identity management is, of course, foundational to any cybersecurity effort, but is also uh, essential for it as background or table stakes, if you will, for implementing a zero trust architecture. Zero trust, of course, is not a single architecture, nor is it a single point solution by, by any means, but you need to have the foundations in place. Now, once those foundations are in place, and that can even include just things like knowing your inventory and knowing your data flows. Where does your data go? Where does it come from? Where is it supposed to go? Can you tell if it's not going where it's supposed to go? And um, also knowing whether it's classified properly. You know, what, what, where is your most sensitive data? Where is your most valuable data? People tend to use the word sensitive. It's really valuable, right? The most valuable data uh, and the data that, that needs to be kept out of um, the, uh, the hands of the bad actors. So those are the foundation, that's the foundation. Now, once that's in place, then you can start thinking about the more, I suppose, uh, forward-leaning, innovative, or newer technologies. And those would include things like micro-segmentation, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, software-defined networking, you know, the ability to, to respond to incidents quickly and automatically, especially automatically, and to isolate uh, individual systems or whole networks uh, in response to events without having to resort to human intervention, both for the sake of speed and accuracy. You know, if you can isolate single systems, that's obvious, and you can uh, determine that only a single system has been compromised and isolate it and quarantine it, that's a lot better than having to quarantine the entire network or, or to cut 
all service off services off to, to everyone. So, uh, and that's achieved through micro segmentation and uh, software defined networking. That's one of the uh, more common technologies that's associated with uh, zero trust, uh, zero trust architecture. The other uh, uh, applicable technology, although it's hardly new, is to encrypt all traffic, even on the internal network, because zero trust architecture or the zero trust philosophy, if you want to call it that, just assumes that your network, that there's no internal network and there's no external network. It's all just as dangerous as all, it's all just as vulnerable. It's all just as fraught with uh, <clears throat> compromise, uh, whether it's a so-called internal network or external network. And of course, that, that means the diminishing perimeter, uh, which means you have to encrypt all traffic at all points uh, wherever possible. And it also means uh, conversely, uh, and a growing attack service. And of course that, the concept of attack surface is a whole, uh, whole separate uh, world. But basically, it's it's all the points of entry, all the places that can be, all the ways that people that, that bad actors can attack your network, and all the uh, points of interest that they want to attack. Basically, is the, is, is uh, what we can think of as the attack surface. So um, that's just a very broad overview of some of the the how to divide the technologies into the the, the table stakes, the foundations and the more forward-leaning things. I would advise against uh, any organization trying to adopt newer, fancier technologies if you're still struggling with the foundations. Um, you know, and be honest with yourself. I mean, and, and there's no shame in it. Lots of organizations struggle with the basics because it's hard to do, so. Right, sure. And what are some of the other major concerns when implementing a zero trust program? Uh, <laughs> how can people avoid the pitfalls well, the uh, some of the um, some of the pitfalls revolve around the misconceptions, uh, which is that zero trust can be implemented through a, a single technology or is a single well-defined architecture. It's really not. It's it's really just a philosophy that says, "Hey, let's assume that our network is vulnerable. Let's assume that we have been breached or that we soon will be," and approach our security efforts commensurately. The, um, the, the, the biggest pitfall, I would say, is changing the mindset, understanding that there's, that there's sort of a, you know, if you will. Now, if you're familiar with the OSI model, it goes from the physical on up to the, uh, to the application level, which are seven layers, but you know, layer eight is the human level. It does, and it's not really specified in the standard, but, it, but it's commonly referred to that way. And layer, you know, the layer eight, the human level is understanding that we're, we're implementing a major change. We're changing a mindset, we're changing a philosophy. For instance, uh, at Google, they got rid of VPNs and firewalls. If you're a traditional cybersecurity person, the idea of getting rid of your firewalls and ditching all of your VPNs, that's a pretty big mindset change. And that alone is probably the biggest pitfall is just you know, convincing people uh, at all levels, whether it's the engineers uh, uh, actually doing the implementation or the executives who are planning uh, the, the financial aspects to this or the mid-level managers who are trying to ensure that the deadlines are met and uh, project, uh, project schedules are uh, in order. Uh, all of them have to, to buy into the, to the process and understand that it's, uh, that it's really going to work and believe that it's really gonna work because otherwise people will either drag their feet, object, or you know, do all the things that people do when there's a major change uh, in, in, in play and, but they don't really believe it or they don't understand it or they don't have faith in it in its results. So I think that's probably the biggest pitfall in zero trust is, is just failing to account for the human level to, to putting all your, uh, your bets or placing all your chips on the technology rather than on what it takes uh, to, to change mindsets and attitudes about security in the organization. Right, sure. So. And what uh, other misconceptions have you encountered regarding zero trust architecture and maybe other lessons learned that you could share? Well, I think uh, <laughs> the biggest misconception is that it's a, it's a, it can be implemented by a single technology or perhaps one or two technologies. Uh, it, 
uh, that's we've already mentioned that uh, you know it, it's not just something you can buy. You can't just go out and buy yourself uh, some some zero trust and, and put it on the uh, uh, you know put it on your network and and just you know pat yourself on the back and you're all done. I think most people do understand that at this point. Uh, the other misconception, though, I think that's a little subtler, is that people tend to because it's such a comprehensive and all-consuming project to implement zero trust it tends to become an end in itself rather than a means to an end. You're not trying to implement zero trust. I know, that sounds ridiculous, right? What you're trying to do is to make your network more secure. Zero trust is a means to an end and it's not an end in itself. And uh, there's no magic star, there's no gold star that says, you know, here you are, boom, we are now, you're now zero trust. Uh, you, you, you finished the job. And, you know, as cybersecurity always is, it's, it's an ongoing moving target. So it, it's, Although, of course, if you're implementing a project, you, uh, a zero trust architecture, and you are engaged in the project, of course, you're going to have goals and deadlines and end states. But the project as a whole is not an end state. It's a means to an end. Uh, so, so that's the other biggest, I think, big misconception is that it's, it's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end, which is to protect your organization from intrusion and to respond uh, in the inevitable intrusion when it happens and to minimize the damage. Sure. And I know there's a uh, several um, zero trust architectures out there. Can you kind of walk through some of the ones that you know and the pros and cons of, of some of them as you heard um, and share sure. maybe some advice there? Thanks. Well, as you mentioned in the in your very kind introduction, I am certified in the Forrester ZTX, which is a zero trust extended framework. So that's the one uh, with which I'm most familiar. There are others, however. Gartner has a, a uh, framework which they call CARTA. Uh, however, I'm not terribly familiar with that, so I'm not going to do much more than just mention that. Uh, I will say that one of the reasons I didn't pursue that is because they, well, it is kind of expensive to get the information. Uh, whereas Forrester, eh, it's not cheap, but cheaper than Gartner. Doesn't mean it's better, just means that I have certain people that approve budgets at my organization, as we all do. Uh, probably the, um, uh, so those are two, uh, Forrester and Gartner. NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has also promulgated a document which they call, and this is how nerdy I am, I know it by heart, SB 800-207, Special Publication 800-207, and it describes <coughs> uh, zero trust architectures uh, in, in the abstract. Now, all three of these frameworks are abstractions and frameworks and uh, describe things in a broad level. The most concrete uh, and perhaps therefore most uh, practical uh, zero trust approach is Google's Beyond Core. It's very, uh, or Beyond Corp. Some, some people say core, some people say corp. I don't know, it's C-O-R-P. Uh, At <clears throat> any rate, it, um, that is a practical implementation to which I alerted, alluded earlier. And uh, there they actually, that's not, just a philosophy or a framework, although they certainly have lots of uh, broad scale documents that you can download and read, uh, but it also has practical implementations and practical uh, uh, outcomes that, that, uh, that you can review and, and understand at your, at your leisure. So th those, are the, those are the four biggies, uh, three, three abstract frameworks, Gartner, Forrester, and Carta, uh, I mean, pardon me, For Forrester, ZTX, uh, Cart Gartner, Carta, NIST 8, uh, 800 207, and then the practical implementation, which, which is Google Beyond Core. I would say, uh, based on my experience and based on my review of those documents, the easiest one to digest is that, believe it or not, wait for it, folks, the government document. Uh, you know, people tend to think of government documents, particularly standards documents from NIST, as being very dense and dry. Well, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that it's a a thrill, of the, a thrill a minute, you know, uh, a read like uh, the next Netflix series, but uh, it is uh, pretty digestible and they lay things out in a very clear fashion. The, uh, that said, I, I think, and maybe I'm simply biased because I'm certified in it, that the Zero uh, Trust ZTX framework from Forrester is the most comprehensive. Um, I did a review and a comparison of these at one point, and I did a, a um, sort of a point by point comparison of all of them. Uh, all of them advocate 
software defined networking and macro segmentation, no surprise there. Uh, all of them emphasize encrypting traffic uh, in transit. Uh, all of them advocate the use of network access control, uh, which I haven't mentioned uh, so far today, but network access control in brief is to just ensure that any device or resource that accesses your, um, your network, uh, well, keeping in mind that your network may not always be uh, as clearly defined as it used to be, is uh, in compliance with, with your uh, standards for uh, configuration. In other words, is it up to date with the latest virus protection? Does it have you know, a, a local firewall in place? Is it encrypting data as, you, as expected? Are the patches up to date, et cetera, et cetera? That, that's an important feature that all of four of these uh, approaches advocate. All of them are big on, on visibility uh, with, of, of devices and um, user, user behavior. Uh, all of them advocate uh, automated response to continuous uh, monitoring and control. Interestingly enough, um, uh, or pardon me, uh, or excuse me, interestingly enough, the only one that specifically calls out encryption of data in place, which I think is foundational, is the Forrester Zero Trust Extended um, uh, Framework. So uh, that, that's, that was something that sort of surprised me and I found interesting because uh, you know, one of the most important things you wanna do is, is to make sure that your data is encrypted in place. So in the event, and remember in the zero trust uh, philosophy, we're assuming that you're gonna be breached. In the event that you're breached, if they, the bad actors steal encrypted data, well, it makes it that much harder for them to, to access the data. If they can decrypt it at their leisure, well, they still may gain access to it, but at least you slow them down a bit. So uh, I would say those are the, that, that, that's the broad level comparison uh, of, of all of these. Uh, the, um, the Forrester approach looks at visibility, uh, looks at uh, visibility of devices, users and user behavior, but they go a little bit deeper on the visibility than the other frameworks. It talks about um, <clears throat> active uh, to network and active de uh, device uh, visibility. Uh, and they also talk about uh, visibility and knowledge of workloads. Uh, if you're familiar perhaps with something like AWS config service, uh, that's making sure that you know what, where all your workloads are, that you're monitoring the performance of those workloads because a change in performance can indicate either just something wrong, something that's gone wrong that isn't necessarily an intrusion, but you wanna know about it, but also, a, um, uh, a change of performance could also be a, a leading indicator of an attack. For instance, as all of a sudden the machine is, uh, uh, CPU cycles have gone way up, they, that may be an indicator that uh, it's been compromised and is being misused for something like Bitcoin mining or something like that. So uh, the Forrester approach emphasizes making sure that you uh, are have visibility and uh, uh, the ability to monitor your entire application stack workloads. In other words, all the applications, that, that includes the application level, the operating system level, the uh, virtual machines and, or containers if you're running something like Docker, uh, and also uh, e even down to the hypervisor level. In other words, look comprehensively at the entire infrastructure. They call it a workload. I think you know perhaps the word infrastructure might be more applicable, but they call it a workload. Uh, all of the elements that require that are required to make sure that an application is is working properly and has not been compromised. And that, that's an aspect of, that I particularly like about the zero trust uh, or the ZTX uh, approach. Um, what I like about the uh, NIST approach is that it tends to simplify things quite a bit. It, uh, it boils things down into a more, um, uh, more uh, straightforward level. They look at all data and resources uh, as, uh, uh, pardon me, they look at all data sources and all computing services, services as resources. Uh, they, in, they look at communication and insist that all of it is secured, although so do, so do the other models. Uh, they want to make sure that access is granted on a per session basis and is updated and monitored uh, uh, throughout, throughout uh, the session. In other words, it's not just log in 
and sit back and assume that some that everything's fine because the session might be hijacked. Log in, monitor the behavior of that session. If something unusual starts to happen, uh, require more require more uh, authentication. Uh, make sure that each uh, that each uh, access is associated with geolocation, time of day, group membership, uh, et cetera, recency of access, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, the NIST approach also uh, wants to make sure that you um, have uh, that you monitor the integrity and security posture of all your assets at all times. That's similar to the visibility of the workloads that I was talking about earlier with Forrester. And that, um, <clears throat> that you have uh, a complete uh, asset inventory. You, you, remember we were talking about foundational technologies. It's, a, it, it's amazing how often and how difficult it can be to collect, to simply collect an inventory of your, uh, of your system. So, you know, it's hard to secure something if you don't know that it's there. And when it's scattered across a wide range of uh, home networks, such as the one that I'm using now, it can be even more difficult to know what systems are on your network and, and uh, which ones are subject to uh, either being compromised or being misused for, uh, for, higher, uh, for, for further compromise, you know, for, for uh, lateral movement, as, as it's called. So um, just to give an example, at one major uh, government uh, uh, organization that runs a lot of hospitals, they mentioned that they have 220,000 makes and models of devices. Now that's not 220,000 devices, that's 220,000 makes and models uh, of devices. And they might have 10, 15, 20, 100 of each, uh, of each make and model. Moreover, since it's a healthcare uh, environment, some of those devices have to be online at all times because literally pe some people's lives can depend on them. You can't just take them down for a minute while you uh, install a new patch or something or are used only uh, intermittently, and, and therefore it's hard to get, uh, get, uh, to, to get any, the, an inventory by scanning the network because it might only be online, say, uh, a few weeks a month for some specialized purpose. So, uh, those are, so that's very broadly speaking, I would say the, the, the uh, Forester takes a, a really comprehensive, is the most comprehensive approach, digs deepest into the visibility aspect, uh, recommends encryption in place where the others don't. NIST takes the probably the simplest and most straightforward approach by creating uh, clear definitions of your of your assets and your resources and what's expected, what each is expected to do. And um, Gartner Carta, well, I don't want to talk about that one too much because I don't know that much about it. But the uh, the the plus uh, side of Google Beyond Core or Corp, depending on. Uh, which uh, side of the country you come from, so I guess, uh, is that it, there are practical implementations, uh, that it is a practical implementation. The downside is that some of what they've done is specific to Google, uh, so they then may not, may, may not be applicable to your organization. As, as, you may, uh, as you may be aware, Google is a rather large organization. Uh, but what they do is they, uh, what Google did was to, um, Divide everything or, or define everything as a managed de device, user identification, uh, <coughs> networks, and access, access control, and everything. In other words, anything on the network falls into one of those categories, which is pretty simple and clear and practical, uh, and, and a good uh, <coughs> good um, uh, starting point for uh, creating a zero trust architecture. Um, so uh, that's an overview of of some of the. Uh, some of the uh, approaches to zero trust that are out there, uh, uh, depending on, on your, you know, your individual needs, your individual approach to how you do things, uh, you can pick and you can choose which the one that you find most uh, uh, appealing or most uh, practical. I would recommend starting with NIST because it's free. You can download the document, it's government, it's not copyrighted or anything like that. You can, you can always, uh, and it's actually not that long, the document, I think it's only like 37 pages. Just, you know, Pretty short, so anyway. That's sure. Um, well, thank you for walking us through all of that, Don. Anything else you wanted to add? Well, just keep in mind it's you know that zero trust is a uh, it's it, it it it's a end to end in itself as I've mentioned, and with any major project, 
you have to keep in mind the old, uh, you know, the, the old uh, well-known triangle, cost, schedule, and performance. Remember that it's a major culture shift, so change management comes into play in a big way. And in fact, uh, when I was getting my Zero Trust Extended certification, that was probably the biggest single chunk of the course was change management, which kind of surprised me. I was expecting a lot, a lot more in specific technologies. That requires, of course, grassroots support. You need to convince the people on the ground that are doing it. You also need uh, top-down support. Man if management isn't behind and if they don't believe it, then it's not going to happen either. And then where possible, if you can quantify return on investment on any major project, including Zero Trust, that's always going to go over well with the people that are responsible for the organization as a whole, particularly the, the money, so that they can go to the, the board or whoever is responsible for the money and say, look, we spent all this money on zero trust implementation, but we can show you that, yes, we are now uh, statistically much less likely to be, to be um, attacked. The, co the average cost of a breach that we estimate is now much smaller than it used to be. Uh, yes, we had a breach, but it was much less costly and we were, we were able to respond to it more, more quickly and at less cost because we had automated uh, remediation in place, things like that. And if you can put those in numbers, that's going to help. That was terrific. Thank you for walking through those considerations of Zero Trust architecture and its implementation. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us for this executive interview series with Signal. Uh, again, that was Don McLean, Chief Cybersecurity Technologist at DLT Solutions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kim.